You're listening to Love is the Answer, a podcast that explores the power of love in real life with your hosts, Lynn Kidd and Laurel Elstrom. Lynn, tell us about this week's guest. Yeah, so I'm honored to have our guest this week, Christina Strutt. Welcome, Christina. It's an honor to have you join us. And I just wanted to say a few words about Christina. I've known Christina now for a couple years. She's a joy to have as a friend. And Christina was born in Malaysia. She has a background in systems engineer. She went to college and lived in UK for a while. And then she moved to the Boston, Massachusetts area. And I think Christina recently told me she's, this is her 40th year anniversary in America. Christina's been a longtime community member of A Course of Love. And she also has her own website, cocreatingclarity.org. She's done a lot of group sessions, especially last year with her Andrew's Net of Jewels. And she also works with people one-on-one with co-creating clarity. So welcome, Christina. We're going to be exploring the idea today of living love during difficult times. Great. And before we get started, I just want to say that Love is the Answer is sponsored in part by Take Heart Publications, who are the publishers of A Course of Love. Visit their website, acourseoflove.org to download the first 24 chapters of A Course of Love for free, to check out the the Zoom groups available, and explore other resources about love. That's www.acourseoflove.org. So let's bring in our guest, Christina. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This is, this is great to be here, and it's going to be fun. Thanks so much for joining us today, Christina. We'd like to begin by asking you the first question that we ask of all of our guests. What does love mean to you? (laughs) How much time do we have? (laughs) Not very much. (laughs) We need the small version. The small version. (laughs) Yeah. It's the really small version, which is always the simplest and most accurate, is love is everything. Everything. For me, it works as an alternative word to source, to God, to life, and to light. Love can be with the body. You can see love, feel love, taste love, smell love in in food and flowers and in the smile, in the eyes of someone, in in nature, hear love, in the sound of a voice. And you can feel it with your heart. You feel it with your whole body. The whole body can light up and it knows, it resonates in love's presence. And... Then we think about it. And in the thinking about it, there's probably the biggest amount of stuff I could talk about, but I'll leave it at that for now. But definitely love and light. And let me say that love is the way I think of it, the way I would use the word. It's a more feminine, all-inclusive word for source. And light is the more masculine, measurable word for source. So love and light are equivalent, and quantum science is connecting the two beautifully. Now, I do have a question for that. Um, So you said that love is everything, and we're talking about love in difficult times. If love is light, does that mean that love is not darkness? Because you did say it was everything. Absolutely, I did. If you asked any scientist what is light, they would be able to tell you, and they can measure it and show it to you with instruments and numbers and all the rest of it. In so many different forms, light shows up. If you ask the scientists to measure darkness, tell you about darkness, they, it's not measurable. There are no measures for darkness. It simply is the absence of light. Therefore, love is everything. I have heard it said recently, and I really liked it, that darkness is that part of creation which is able to receive light. Kind of an interesting way to look at it, isn't it? Because what light is already light so darkness can receive light Mm -hmm. and the void they're coming to to see as black holes is the genesis before light there was darkness the void Mm -hmm. i would like to ask here a question for christina all your communications in with your 
three phrases, which I, which I do love. And I just wanted to see if you could share a little bit about how that speaks to you. The only response is love. The only time is now. And we are the ones. So I'll just repeat that. The only response is love. The only time is now. And we are the ones. Well, first of all, that phrase, I think I wrote it in a public way for the first time a couple of years ago. You know, I'm always looking for ways to synthesize everything and make it real clear, direct, and simple. And that's where I've ended up so far. That's not to say it's the end point, but to talk about it just a little bit, I have to start at the end of it about we are the ones. So right now, before I even joined this podcast, I was holding you, Lynn, and Laurel in my heart and all the people who are going to be listening and just being there with you all. The truth is, I was just with myself physically. So that's an example of we are the ones. In any moment, I'm with myself and it begins right there. And from that presence, I can expand and include anybody. And of course, I could be at a party and doing the same thing. But we are the ones simply means whatever is in front of me. And that could be me, myself, and I, and I am, and my teacup and my mug of tea. All of it is love. So that's the first part of it. The only time is now is part of that presence. It is now. Now is the only, and that's again a quantum thing. Everything is present in this moment. The past is gone. The future isn't here. All the potential is right here in this moment. And living in presence means being in this moment. Mm -hmm. And love is the answer. That's kind of the culmination of being present in that way. That's where the answers come. What is it do I have to say or do or act or move? What is my next right thing to do? I, I spent many years defining love to be the soft and tender and loving, sweet, kind things. It's all those things and it's more. Can you take that, those sentiments, like apply them practically for someone that might really be going through a difficult time right now? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there are a lot of people who are because, you know, life as a human is not the easiest thing in the world. So if, if you were to apply this to someone who's suffering, how, how would you frame that? Well, I can talk from my experience for a second. Right at this time, I first want to say that I have spent years in deep, deep depression myself. Most of it was alone and not understood with nobody supporting me. So I totally get that feeling of complete isolation while the world goes on around me. I am coping on my own. Not just that, but I'm also stepping up to go to my job, take care of my family, be the daughter that my mother expects me to be, and on and on and on it goes, you know? I want to say I have great, deep, in my body experience and empathy for that. There's kind um, of a, a part of that feeling of depression that comes with a feeling of, I'm on the outside looking in exactly. and, and nobody else is. I'm exactly. the only one, right? Right, exactly. You feel so isolated. You feel like a, a bit of a freak, really, mm -hmm. on the edges of, of society. And, and right now, everybody's in, in lockdown and anyone who is still carrying and is you know carrying any wounds of trauma or past things that are causing depression, that's going to get triggered. I mean, that happened for me and my family on Sunday. And I, I wrote about it and I called it shattering because I literally felt like I shattered into a thousand pieces. What I was thinking of is how, you could, how we could use those three phrases to help the person who is suffering. For instance, um, the only response is love. How would a person who is depressed respond to their situation with love? How would a person who is depressed apply the only time is now and we are the one? I will say from my experience, the only thing that, that I could do for myself, not that it was easy to remember on my own, was to breathe myself into the moment. 
there were many nights when I couldn't sleep. And so taking deep breaths to bring myself into my body right here and now. I am with myself. Now that's another step, remembering that love begins with loving myself. That for me has been the PhD and postdoctoral work of the last couple of years. And think about that, Laurel. I mean, I have been on this journey a very long time and it is the hardest thing to do to embrace myself. What is it I need now? That's how I would apply those three things. It's really, and if you have a course of love, I can recall many, many nights when all I could do was do this breathing as I'm lying awake all night and say over and over and over, I dedicate all thought to union. That's all I could do. I, I guess I can't answer it for somebody else, but it could be anything from distracting yourself to mm -hmm. reaching out to someone or journaling or putting on some music. Thank you, know. you, Christina. I just wanted to say, yeah, I felt like what you were saying is like dropping into that space of your heart, becoming fully present with who you are in the moment. And then from there, a response arises. For yourself, yeah. yes, because no Maybe. one else can tell you what to do. Yeah. You speak of living in the unknown. That's something I've seen you speak about and write about recently on Facebook, living in the unknown. And I think that was a song from Frozen 2. Yes. So can you share a little bit with us on how living, living in the unknown would be related to living, living the love of who we are? Yeah, well, strangely enough, they're actually the same thing. And what is fascinating about this time, uh, what is so interesting is that everyone is, in, you know, because of the circumstances, having to recognize that it was a kind of a little ironical that we actually thought we could plan ahead and know and have things scheduled and even though we know things always don't go to plan in fact rarely go exactly to plan but now we know because we don't know we one thing we do know is that we don't know so the way it's linked for me very much is that when you're living love love knows but love knows with certainty only in that moment so just like what we talked about okay. you breathe yourself right here right now and embrace yourself or whoever you're with and listen in, then the answers come. So you mentioned Frozen too, and I've got to say that for this time, and that's why I've repeated it a few times. I first wrote about it back in November when the movie came out, Frozen 2, because the two theme songs have exactly the practical advice we need right now. Queen Elsa sings Into the Unknown, and that's recognizing that we don't know is huge. Mm -hmm. It sounds trivial, but it's actually a huge shift to make, to recognize that we truly don't know what's going to happen in the next moment, literally. Mm -hmm. The other song is sung by her sister, Princess Anna, and that is just do the next right thing. Mm -hmm. And what is that right thing? No one can tell you. Your heart tells you. It is a moment by moment thing. And probably the prayer I pray the most frequently these days is help me to remember to ask for help. I know that sounds a little bit recursive, but there are hosts of everybody you can imagine out there in the realms that are unseen. Loving Just beings, yeah. <laughs> like beings of light, pure, mm -hmm. you know, pure light, yes. angels, archangels, ascended masters, call them whatever you want to call them. You know, your star family, we have all kinds of, you know, God, Jesus, Mother Mary, call them what you want, but ask them. Yeah, and we're, the fact that we're all sovereign creators, that there's not going to be anybody interfering unless they're invited. Exactly. So I, I, I love that prayer that we remind me to ask for help mm -hmm. because I, I, I'll bet you can agree yeah. there has been no time in my life when I've asked for help that it didn't show up. Absolutely. It may not show up in the way I thought it would, but yeah. it always comes. Yeah. It always comes. And that's a beautiful yeah, Beautiful I love that. Put out there for that. people that are struggling. Yeah, yeah. We better turn toward the question of the week. This is the time when the when all three of us address a question from a listener. So here's today's question. 
I've struggled with depression for most of my life. There are times when I feel swallowed up by darkness, almost as if my whole being has been taken over and I can't find any hope. In what way could love be the answer to my depression? Yeah, thank you, Laurel. I think we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. Yeah. We kind of delved into this. But yeah, I can speak from my own personal experience as well. I've had, you know, I've struggled with depression my whole life. There was a time about mm, seven, eight years ago where I really went into a deep depression and I started having really bad panic attacks. You know, I started having thoughts of suicide and all that kind of stuff. I was always, I felt ashamed about it. Like, you know, here I am doing the Course in Miracles all these years and spirituality and all this kind of stuff and that you know, I can't get it together or whatever. So anyway, what I, the point that I wanted to make was, is that love, love is the answer. I, I was able to honor myself and love myself and have the courage and the compassion for myself to reach out for help. Did a lot of inner work with a woman that she was a practitioner of sand play, which is a Jungian psychotherapeutic modality where you make scenes in the sand with figurines and it ha actually it's a it's a way of expressing similar to art journaling I did some art journaling uh, courses as well and also reached out to a psychiatrist was on medication for a long time and I still am but I'm only taking you know like one third of the dose that I used to take but just to sum it all up, it's like reaching out for help and realizing it's okay to ask for help. We're all in this together. And to love myself and to find the compassion of myself to be able to reach out and get the help that I needed. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah. Sometimes you have to love yourself enough to get help. Yeah. Christina, do you want to respond to that question? Yeah, I love everything Lynn said. I mean, she's really described it very well. So maybe I can take it a little, little, little deeper in a way, which is really the thing about it is love the darkness. That's the short answer. The darkness is that genesis, the void. It is scary because of the way we've been conditioned. And it is also what is. It is not something separate. Wherever there's light, there are shadows. Wherever there is light, until light floods everything, everywhere, which we're not there yet, there is always going to be darkness. But loving it, I think for, for, for me, in the times when I was deeply depressed, it was the fear of the darkness that was harder to be with than the darkness itself. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm hearing in this question when they say, I feel almost swallowed up by it. So the, for me, it is like, keep reminding yourself you are here. Hold on to your tea mug, write in your journal, hold on to a soft toy, hold on to a loved one if you have a loved one with you and let yourself go into that darkness. It's the void of birth. It is like the cocoon, the caterpillar dissolves completely. It is dark. So as a human being, I'd say, <sighs> cocoon yourself. Do whatever your body, your heart, and your mind need to feel safe. Thank you, Christina. Yeah, Laurel, did you have something you wanted to yeah, share? I sure do, of course. Um, and I'm reminded as Christina was speaking about the stories of Byron Katie and Eckhart Tolle, who both were in deep depression, deep darkness, when they had their first illumination experience, when they turned and faced their darkness. But um, as I was considering this question myself, um, I, I wanted to offer a practice, an adaptation of the loving kindness practice from Buddhism. If you've ever worked with loving kindness, it has three phases. And I thought, boy, it'd be really nice to do this for yourself when you're in a 
a state of suffering, but to change it. The first phase of it, you imagine yourself sitting in a chair in front of you. You send yourself blessings, the one who is suffering. May you be peaceful. May you find joy. May you know that you're loved. May you feel safe. And you send yourself those blessings. And then when that feels complete, find the one in you who is the victim, who's suffering, the little child that's curled up in the corner. Find that person and send them love. May you be safe. May you know that you're loved. May you feel peace. And then in the third phase, find the one that you feel is victimizing you. Find the darkness, the monster, the thing that's creating the fear and turn and say, may you know you're loved. May you feel safe. May you feel at peace with what's happening. I would think that those three things are an extreme form of self-love and can be practiced even in a moment at any time. So I would just offer that to yeah. them. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you both, Laurel and Christina, for sharing that. And unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. <laughs> so again, Christina, thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to have you. And we'd love to feature your question in our question of the week segment. So please submit your questions by emailing us at loveisalwaystheanswer at gmail.com. Love is always the answer at gmail.com. We'd love to hear your questions. And thank you everyone for joining us on Love is the Answer podcast. We really do love you.